very fortunate to have today uh, speaking in the circus uh, seminar uh, and also uh, visiting us at circus uh, for uh, a while until the end of August, uh, Dave Xiao, um, who uh, I first know from his time here as one of our star undergraduates, uh, class of 2003, is that? Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, after that, he went and did a PhD at Princeton. Uh, did a lot of interesting work on uh, network uh, security, cryptographic protocol, network security. Also done interesting work on um, other things in cryptography, <coughs> and, uh, zero knowledge proofs, and complexity, communication complexity, uh, and has uh, 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 done some really inspiring work on. Uh, 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 economics of privacy, the interface of uh, privacy and mechanism design, game theory, and he'll be telling us a little bit about that work today. Okay. Thanks, Lil. Uh, so I'm very happy to be able to talk to you today about uh, some of the work that I've done and um, also members of the audience have done uh, relating uh, incentives and privacy. So uh, let me just begin by giving you kind of a hypothetical example, maybe not so hypothetical. Uh, about why uh, privacy and incentives should be studied together. So if you remember uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it was discovered that Apple was tracking and recording the locations of all the users of their iPhones. And this was a big scandal because uh, you know, they were doing it behind the users' backs. And clearly, this is something that is not acceptable because it uh, it uh, harms the privacy of, of the users. So what, what might Apple do to try and you know, mitigate some of the concerns? So um, you know, as many of you are familiar with, uh, there's this uh, great literature on uh, differential privacy, which gives us ways of doing data analysis while preserving privacy in some you know, mathematical way. So maybe one thing that Apple could do is just to say, well, you know, we're sorry but we promise that we'll use your data only in a differentially private way. Okay, so we're gonna give you some kind of mathematical guarantee that uh, you know, not too much information about your individual uh, locations are revealed to the public. Okay, and so you know, as users, we might look at this and think, well, I guess that's a little bit better, but still, you know, you're kind of benefiting from knowing my data and I don't really get anything out of it. Right? Why should I help you? Why is this any more acceptable? And so, okay, maybe Apple then goes back to the drawing board and says, okay, not only will we use your data in a differentially private way, but we'll do, it, we'll do something that you want with it. So maybe we'll use it to open new Apple stores close to you. Okay. And so maybe at this point then, as users, we're, we're, we're willing to uh, submit because you know, we love Apple, we want to be able to buy their, their stuff, and if we don't have to go too far to get it, that's better for us. Okay, so I think this is, you know, it, it's a little bit uh, facetious, but I think it does illustrate the link between uh, incentives and privacy very, uh, very accurately. And so, you know, of course, this is just uh, one example. We know that privacy is a big concern nowadays uh, in general because, because of the development of uh, information technology. So, you know, Facebook and Google probably know more about each of us than we do ourselves. And the NSA probably knows even more than that. Uh, and, you know, you can ask yourself, why do these people care? Why do these organizations care about our private data? And I think you know, the right answer is that our private data is valuable. Right? There's some kind of utility to be gained from collecting and analyzing this private data. Okay, and it's valuable for many different reasons. The different kind of data uh, can be used for different things. You know, things like genomic data or medical data can be studied to produce new medical advances. Uh, social network data or search data can be used to generate ad revenues for these companies. Um, you know, traffic data, things like the Hubway or uh, you know, um, uh, taxi commission data can be used to improve ur urban planning. Uh, our communications data is valuable as we've seen uh, with the Snowden revelations for uh, presumably uh, national security reasons and, and so on. Uh, but one thing I want to point out is that you know, when, when we're, as we're thinking about why this data is valuable, in most of these cases, the data analysts don't care about the data because it's private. They care about it because they can do something useful with it, right? Maybe with the notable exception of, you know, NSA spying. For the other things, it's really the fact that they can do something interesting with the data and not the fact that the data is private, that they care about it. 
Okay, so privacy really comes in, uh, when, when we think about incentives and privacy, it really comes in at how the individuals value privacy, right? And here, uh, it's clear that, you know, as human beings, uh, we value privacy just uh, at some kind of inherent level. I'll talk a little bit more about maybe how we should think about this in some more, in some more concrete ways later on in the talk, but, you know, this is clearly a concern. And so, therefore, we should, um, we should try and find ways to limit the amount of privacy loss that individuals suffer even if we you know, want to use the data to do something like some of the applications I just mentioned. Okay, even better, one of the things that I want to talk about today is how do we not only limit their private loss, but actually compensate them for their private loss. Right? So make it so that even though they're losing some privacy, they're getting something else in return, and that will, on the whole, make this uh, acceptable. Okay, so uh, let me just briefly outline what the, the major parts of the talk are gonna be. So first, I'm gonna spend uh, quite, a bit, uh, quite a bit of time telling you, you know, how to think about quantifying privacy loss. This is certainly not a question that we've resolved, but I think there are a lot of interesting ideas that have already been developed here and that uh, are worth discussing. Uh, and one of the key ideas, of course, is to use differential privacy as a way to um, quantify privacy loss. And then I'll tell you about two specific kinds of uh, settings where we're going to try and trade off privacy loss and, uh, and utility. Uh, so one application is uh, application of purchasing private data, so using money as a way to compensate individuals for their privacy loss. And you know you can think of this as modeling uh, settings like uh, you know political polls or marketing surveys or, or things like that. Uh, and another area that I'll touch on at the end is uh, privacy-aware mechanism design, where you're not necessarily using money, but you're using some other kind of utility. So maybe. Um, utility from, you know, where we decide to build new roads or build new hospitals or, or things like that. Uh, and we'll see the, how, how these two settings differ. Okay, so let me begin with um, the topic of uh, quantifying privacy loss. And I want to say that the, the talk is going to be at a very high level overall. So if you have any questions, anything's not clear, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Um, if you do want to know more about the technical details, you can come talk to me afterwards. I'm not going to spend too much time on it during the talk, but I'd be happy to talk to you about it afterwards. Okay, okay so let's look at how we quantify uh, privacy loss. So to do so, let's you know, actually rewind a little bit and go back to just uh, recalling some of the very basic uh, ideas for mechanism design. So uh, mechanism design is you know, the problem of how do you uh, compute using information that you have to elicit from uh, various individuals. These individuals are self-interested, so they might not tell you their actual data if it's you know, not to their interest to tell you. Maybe they'll, it's to their interest to actually lie to you about what their data is. Okay, and so, um, you know, kind of one of the typical examples of uh, mechanism design is uh, the idea of auction. So imagine here we have uh, an antiques auction, right? So these guys all love technology antiques, and this is the, the original iPhone, so they're, they're interested in buying uh, an iPhone. So there are usually two kind of goals that are in tension in the prob problem of mechanism design. There's a goal of the mechanism. In this application, the, the goal of the mechanism, let's say if we're the auctioneer, is to maximize the revenue, right? We wanna make a lot of money. There can be other goals too, but you know, let's, let's not uh, focus too much on that right now. The goals of the individuals are to optimize their utility. So, you know, presumably each of these individuals have, you know, some kind of value that they assign to the thing that they're trying to buy, and their net utility is going to be, uh, you know, one, one way of measuring their net, net utility might be how much they pay, uh, the, how much they value the item minus how much they pay. It's like a... And the goal of the mechanism designer is to come up with a mechanism, a way of computing the outcome, in this case, you know, the winner and how much the winner should pay, in a way that satisfies you know, uh, these properties. So you know, there, are, there are other properties that we, uh, we can ask for, but these are the ones that we'll focus on for this talk. So first, there should be approximately optimal, so uh, the outcome should you know, maximize, maybe up to some approximation error, the, the revenue, let's say, of the, the, uh, the auctioneer. But another goal that's very equally important is that the mechanism be truthful because you want the rational players to reveal their true uh, preferences. Right? And this is important because if they are incentivized to tell you something that's not true, 
then how can, how, how does it, what does it mean then for the mechanism to be optimal? Because you're computing on sort of incorrect data. Right? So it's uh, this, uh, people say garbage in, garbage out, right? If, you, if, the gar if the input that you get is garbage, then the output that you can give can only, can only be garbage. And another goal that we can hope for, uh, that we will you know, try to achieve, is that the mechanism should be individually rational. So that the individuals, they don't, they're not harmed simply by participating in the game. You know, like in this case, at, at worst, they walk away and nothing's, nothing's happened. So let me talk a little bit more about um, utility and how utility is usually modeled. So you know, utility is kind of like this vague thing. We don't really know what necessarily it means. But usually, um, for convenience, we uh, use money as a proxy for utility. So we, we assign some kind of monetary value, and we, uh, we, try, we, we try to optimize that value. Okay, and that's what we'd, we'll do for, for the purposes of this talk as well, at, at least for the most part. And so the, the utility uh, depends, you know, if we look again at this, uh, this setting, the utility depends mainly on two things, right? Actually, it depends only on two things. So it depends on the outcome of the, the mechanism, so who the winner is and uh, what they pay. And it also depends on the personal preferences, preferences of the player. So in this case, you know, since Alice, she really loves uh, Apple, she's willing to pay $1,000 for it. So if we sell Alice the, the iPhone for $100, she gets $900 worth of utility. So notice here that there are two important assumptions that we made in modeling this utility. So first is that the utility is independent of how the outcome is chosen. Right? It doesn't matter like, what exactly was the function that, uh, that the auctioneer ran in order to compute the outcome. The utility that Alice derives at the end is just a function of her outcome and her personal preferences. All right, so, and, and I want to just to be clear, you know, there are other properties about the mechanism that do depend on how it's computed, you know, the, this uh, truthfulness and individual rationality. But those don't directly figure into the utility that the, um, that the player himself gets, him or herself gets. The other thing to point out here is that the utility of, uh, uh, let's say, Alice, is independent also of the other player's preferences, right? So the fact that Bob cares, uh, you know, values the iPhone at $100 versus Carol uh, valuing the, the iPhone at $1, they don't influence Alice's utility. Right. And so, you know, these are, this is, uh, I don't want to say that, like every single mechanism design problem is framed this way, but this is kind of the standard model. And so, the first challenge is uh, to observe that privacy does not behave like a normal utility. Quantity. So in particular, it does not follow, uh, it does not satisfy these assumptions that it's independent of how the outcome is chosen and that it's independent of the other player's preferences. Okay, so let me just give you a very simple example to, uh, to show this. So let's suppose we're the, the Crimea and we're trying to, do, to vote between independence or the status quo. Okay. So there's, let's say there are two things that we can run. We can run the Russian mechanism, which always outputs independence. <laughs> Or we can run the, the majority mechanism that actually takes the majority. Okay. So now suppose that I actually prefer independence. And suppose that some observer who's trying to learn something about me, actually, he, he knows, he has side information, he knows that all the other players are split 50-50. Okay. So in this case, it should be intuitively clear that the Russian mechanism, if we ran the Russian mechanism, I get, some better privacy, I get a better privacy guarantee than if we ran the majority mechanism. All right. If we know that uh, the, we're running the Russian mechanism, then the, infer, the, output of the, the outcome of the game has, reveals nothing about me. But if we know that we're running the majority mechanism, then we do know, the observer does know that, uh, what my preference is. Okay. So the lessons to take away are that you know, both of the assumptions that I mentioned on the previous slide, they break. So, here, it really depends on how the mechanism maps the inputs to the outputs uh, when we think about privacy. And furthermore, it depends, you know, my privacy depends on knowledge that the adversary might know about the other players and about their preferences. Okay, so it seems like we really need to kind of go back to the drawing board and think about how do we, uh, how do we measure privacy and how do we quantify it and that we cannot use this kind of traditional framework from game theory where we only care about the outcome and the individual's preferences. 
Okay, so let's do that. So let's step back for a second and think about why privacy is valuable. So, you know, the first thing that you can say is that, you know, people care about privacy because they care about privacy. It's somehow in our human nature and that, you know, they're, we get an icky feeling when other people know too much about us. Right? Uh, another, a related kind of concern might be that there are cultural taboos, right? Things, about, things like sexuality or disease or death. Uh, these are things that people don't like to talk about and they don't really want other people to know uh, things about them with regard to those things. But you know, let's dig in a little bit deeper and think about um, more concretely what might the problems, you know, why are these concerns there? So uh, one way of, you know, one concern uh, that's a little more concrete is that we might be afraid of discrimination, right? If people know a lot of things about us, they know some private information about us, they might use that information to discriminate against us. So you know, in the case of medical records, we might be afraid that if the insurance company knows that um, I have cancer, that they won't accept me as a, as a patient. Or things like you know, uh, racial profiling or uh, religious profiling, uh, et cetera. Okay, and more generally, I think this is a special case of, um, really a special case of uh, kind of a more general game theoretic way of looking at things is that you, know, you can view life as like a sequence of games, right? Your action today uh, changes the state of the world, which affects how your actions tomorrow are going to affect you. And so you can think of life kind of as an extensive form game, extensive form game where we want to, and it's an incomplete information game, right? People don't know everything about you. They don't know all your preferences. So one way of thinking about why privacy is valuable is that maybe I want to keep some information about myself secret so that I gain an advantage, competitive advantage at later points in, the, in time. Okay, and I think this is, a, this is a very appealing way of thinking about things, but unfortunately, you know, it's a little too complicated, right? What's, what is the game of life? How do we know what the games are going to be in the future that we're going to play? So we're not going to go, uh, go with this approach. I think it's important to keep this approach in mind, but I think, um, you know, as far as I'm aware of, it's a little bit too complicated and no one's really been able to give a uh, satisfactory way of uh, modeling this. And you know, a lot of times the, the, the games that you play, play in the future are simply unknown, right? There's no way to know what they're gonna be. So instead, we're gonna take ideas from uh, differential privacy, and differential privacy gives us strong bounds on the amount of information that's revealed about uh, our private uh, data. And in particular, one benefit of using differential privacy is that it's going to allow us to uh, give bounds on how much you, utility you lose in your future games, you know, if we were using this extensive form model. It'll give us bounds on how much, you, uh, how much your utility can decrease even without knowing what those games are. So you know, we save ourselves the trouble of uh, modeling those games and still by using this approach, we'll get bounds on how much uh, we can lose in those games. I'm expected to gain more than if I play the full information game. And I'm wondering if you know any, or if maybe someone in the audience knows anything about that. Like an example of a game like where example, by keeping something secret, you get a better. Exactly. Um, yeah, you can, you can definitely uh, come up with this. Well, there's an example that's used in, um, in the supply chain, which is <clears throat> if I'm if I'm running an, an, a reverse auction and I'm, I'm collecting bids from suppliers, if the supplier bids their true whether it's their, their complete information about their amount they need to get paid now, then next year I can I can use that and I can extract I can I can offer you exactly the amount that that you need next year. So I, I so 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 this year I'm buying something. And, and you tell me exactly what your cost basis is, the next year I can use that information. So that's an example that's used to explain why the victory auction is not used in the supply chain and why um, a clock auction or something like that would be used where you retain private information about what your actual willingness was. That makes sense. Clock auctions like ascending. Clock would like it would be descending. Descending in this case. Thanks. Okay, so um, 
you know, so without further ado, let's let's talk about differential privacy and how do we how do we use it to uh, quantify these privacy losses. Um, I imagine most of you don't need to to see the definition, but uh, let me do it just to make sure the notation is clear and that uh, we're all on the same page. So the intuition behind differential privacy uh, is that you know a mechanism is private if any observer basically can't detect any change in the output when a single player's input is modified. And so to, 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 to model this more formally, let's suppose that each individual's data is some element of some universe x. Uh, a database is a, an n, uh, n element vector. And two databases, x and x prime, are neighbors. And I'll say i neighbors to, to just point out which entry they differ in. They're i neighbors if they're, um, if they're different on the ith entry and then identical everywhere else. Okay. And the definition of differential privacy uh, due to uh, Dork Mashari and Stephen Smith is that um, a randomized mechanism M that takes a database's input and produces some output is epsilon differentially private if for all neighboring databases, so they can neighbor on, you know, they can be i neighbors for any i. Uh, x and x prime and any subset of the output space S, the probability that m of x uh, produces an element of S is roughly the same as the probability that m of x prime produces an element of S. Okay. So S is kind of some property that maybe the adversary is trying to learn. And this says that the probability that we satisfy the property is basically the same whether our input was originally x or x prime. And since these differ on only one player's uh, entry, it's you know, modeling how, how much the output distribution changes when one player's input changes. Okay, so um, some observations about the definition. So this is a worst case definition. So there's no randomness in the inputs. Uh, the only randomness is in the randomness of the mechanism itself. Uh, so in particular, we don't have to assume any kind of knowledge about a prior or something on the, on the inputs. Uh, you know, clearly this is something that depends very heavily on how the mechanism maps the inputs to the output, which is, you know, in, in accordance with our intuition about privacy. And also, uh, the definition, you know, this notion of how far the distributions are when you run m of x and m of x prime, it's a very strong notion. In, in particular, it's stronger than, you know, some, 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 some several other uh, traditional notions of distance in a... Uh, in probability theory, so in particular, it's stronger than statistical distance. So if m of x and m of x prime are close in this way, then they're also close in statistical distance. Uh, it's also stronger than mutual information. So if you know that uh, you know, a mechanism satisfies epsilon differential privacy, then the amount of information that the mechanism leaks about any uh, individual is bounded by epsilon uh, when you measure according to mutual information, and regardless to you know, whatever uh, priors you have over the, the inputs. So one consequence of the fact that you know, this is a very strong measure and that it's stronger than statistical distance is that in particular, uh, for, any, uh, you know, for any neighboring databases f, x and x prime, and for any function f uh, over the, the output space, when you run f on m of x, the expected value of f is going to be roughly the same as when you run f on m of x prime. And this is a simple consequence of uh, uh, differential privacy. And so this, in particular, now is going to tell you that, well, you know, we don't know what the future games that you might play are, but there's some function that you know, captures what the payoff that you're going to get from all these future games is. Right? So, this, so there's some function f that, given you know, the outcome of this game, computes the, the, the optimal payoff that you'll get in the future games. We don't know what this is, but it doesn't matter because the guarantee tells us that for any function f, the amount of uh, utility get in the future games, or you know, the, the value of this function, is going to be roughly the same whether you played x or x prime. Okay, so we're getting a bound on how much you can lose in utility. Right? You lose this like, little epsilon, but you know, hopefully this epsilon we can consider as something that players are indifferent to. You lose a little bit, but it's bounded, and it's bounded in a very strong way without knowing what the future games are, uh, without knowing uh, anything besides the fact that this mechanism is differentially private. Okay. 
OK, so that's differential privacy. So let's see how we can try and use you know, these ideas to quantify privacy loss. So um, you know, differential privacy is already quantifying privacy loss uh, in the sense that the smaller, you know, if, you have a if you have a mechanism M that is epsilon differentially private, then the smaller M is, uh, the smaller epsilon is, the more private it is. But let's see how we turn that into um, kind of a more game theoretic notion. So let me uh, assume that players' inputs are split into two parts. So every player, so there's, you know, there's some kind of game that's fixed. Uh, it doesn't matter for the time being what that game is. Uh, the, each player has some private data x. And we'll assume that they also have some uh, real number pi that, is, uh, that we'll call their privacy valuation. Okay. And pi will typically think of as being non-negative, although it's not strictly necessary. And pi is sort of measuring how much does, uh, does an individual care about their privacy. So the larger pi is, then for a given amount of you know, information being leaked, the more uh, the, that privacy leak is going to harm them. Okay? And, if they're, and if pi is zero, then intuitively they don't care about privacy at all. So regardless of how much information is leaked, they don't suffer any harm. So here's the, the first try that we can we can use. And so this is a, a loss function that was uh, first proposed by Goshen Roth. So the loss function, which I'll denote by lambda i m, so i for the ith player, and m is the mechanism that we're, uh, we're trying to measure. Uh, the, the loss function takes as input um, the, the vector of all the Players' data, so including their, so all their all the players' inputs, so including their data and their privacy valuations. It also takes as input uh, a particular outcome of the game. But this candidate loss function is actually going to ignore those. So what it's going to do is just going to say, let me figure out what is the smallest epsilon such that m is epsilon differentially private, and then I'll scale up by this privacy valuation. Okay. So it actually you know it actually ignores the the inputs and, and the outputs. So this is actually, you know, it's, it's actually not bad, right? Because this, this is saying, you know, if, if we think about what, uh, how, how private M might be, if M is very differentially private, so epsilon differentially private for a very small epsilon, uh, we, see, we saw that on the previous slide, that means that the output uh, varies almost not at all when a particular player's input changes. And so intuitively that says that, you know, player's uh, privacy loss should be small. And that's, that is captured by this, uh, by this function. But, you know, th this is, it, it doesn't seem like this is really the, the right notion in several senses. So these are critiques that were um, brought up by uh, Kobe et al. and then by um, various other members of the audience, Yiling and Stephen and uh, Salil. Um, so the first thing is, you know, this loss function completely ignores the, the inputs and the outputs. And that seems, like, that seems like a waste because it seems like there are, you know, if, if, you're, if you have a particular input where the mechanism is going to, um, it's not going to reveal much information at all about that input, then even if the mechanism reveals a lot about the inputs somewhere else on some very different input, on this first input where it doesn't reveal much information, the privacy loss should be a lot smaller. Right? And this, is, this cannot be captured by this notion. The other thing is that um, can we really assume that privacy loss exactly equals something? Right here, we we, we uh, actually set the privacy loss function to be equal to this, and this seems uh, problematic because it seems hard to use privacy as a threat to punish people because we don't necessarily know what people actually care about. So, you know, if we are able to bound the amount of information that is leaked, then we're we're able to say that the privacy loss is at most something. But if we say that, you know, we know that this mechanism leaks a lot of information about uh, the inputs, we don't necessarily know if the information that is leaked is the information that the people care about. And so to say that the loss is going to be large in that case, it might not actually be modeling reality. Okay. So instead, um, what uh, these papers propose, it's to study uh, classes of functions instead of a single fixed function. So, and the most important class of functions that uh, was proposed is the following. So, we call these loss functions that are bounded by differential privacy. So, um, just to 
go over the definition. So the loss function is going to be bounded by the privacy valuation. Still, we use the privacy valuation as a, like a scaling factor. But then we're going to measure the, um, the maximum log ratio of probabilities over uh, all possible i neighbors of uh, the input in question. So what happens when we fix, uh, when we um, flip the i-th entry of the input, how much does that change the probability that we produce this particular output y? Right. And the worst one is the one that uh, changes the probability uh, by a lot, so that, such that this log ratio is very high, because in that case, we know that you know, if, we see this, uh, if we see this output, and we know some information about the input, you know, as, as an adversary might have some side information, then we, can, we know that you know, there's a lot more chance that the, um, the player's input was you know, the, the, the x that's in this vector rather than the x <laughs> that's in that vector. And so uh, also, why, why do we call this bounded by differential privacy? Well, it turns out that this is kind of the, this log ratio is essentially the epsilon that is uh, the epsilon differential privacy. Okay, but except that this is kind of on a per input kind of basis. Okay, so let's, let's take this and fold this back into the mechanism design problem. So in order to study privacy aware mechanism design and privacy aware utility, what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, take a uh, linear combination of these two kinds of utilities. So the overall utility, which we'll call the privacy aware utility, it's gonna take as input um, the vector of all players' inputs and uh, a particular output. And it's going to be, so there's gonna be part of it that's kind of like the traditional utility that we get from you know, purchasing an item or getting a facility located somewhere. And then we're gonna subtract away this privacy loss. Right? And the privacy loss is going to be, uh, you know, usually we'll consider privacy loss functions that are bounded by differential privacy. And now we can ask the same thing. So we want the mechanism to be uh, approximately optimal, to be truthful, and to be individually rational. And notice that here, individual rationality, for this privacy-aware utility function, it just means that the utility that we gain is enough to compensate for the, the, loss, the privacy loss that we incurred. Uh, so we're going to ask for dominant strategy uh, truthfulness in, in most of the, the works, but it's, you know, it's equally interesting to consider more relaxed uh, notions. So maybe, maybe what you're trying to point out is that, um, in fact, players here, if they don't know the other player's inputs, they can't compute this loss function themselves in some sense. Uh, and that is true. Um, but uh, we're, we're still going to ask for uh, Truthfulness in, in this sense, um, you know, if we can achieve this, and this is only stronger than you know, if we could, if they didn't know the other place inputs. David, yep. Is, is M here the marginal, or what does M represent? M. I, I, you, you mentioned it, but I just. Oh, M is the mechanism. Oh, okay. okay. M is the mechanism. Yeah, because the, the loss function depends on the definition of the mechanism oh, itself. Okay. Okay, and so our design methodology is going to be the following. So we're going to fix a class of loss functions. You know, usually we'll fix the class of loss functions bounded by differential privacy. Uh, and then we're going to show that the, we're gonna build a mechanism and we're gonna prove that it bounds the privacy loss in some sense. So for example, it might be, we, we, we might prove that M is differentially private and that combined with the fact that we're only considering Loss functions bounded by differential privacy. It gives you a bound on the loss. Yeah. I just want to ask about the uh, number you said that you have other cases where it's difficult to compute. Sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Um, just asking about the case, if you know about cases where, in, where it's difficult to, difficult to compute the player's uh, loss of privacy. Um, in those cases, can you somehow give them a certificate that uh, you computed something which is uh, which is maximizes their, their utility? Um, I mean, we're gonna try to build mechanisms such that the, the, we prove that the mechanism itself gives that guarantee. Yeah. 
Um, you're saying like, if, what if the mechanism cheats and we want to assure that the mechanism was run correctly or? Yeah, yeah. yeah if it's difficult for me to, you know, to, to actually compute my, you know, my, my utility in some sense, right? Yeah. Then I would like to know that the mechanism did something that was good for me. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, you could conceivably try to incorporate some kind of, you know, like formal proof of, of this fact, but it's problematic because it seems like in order to prove that, you might also need to reveal everyone else's input to, to, to prove it. So I'm not sure if, yeah. Uh, the true inputs. Yeah. yeah, so when we consider the privacy loss of one player, we assume that everyone else played their true inputs, and then we see how that affects the, this individual's privacy loss. So, maybe you'll get to this, but does yeah. that change? I mean, the point you made earlier about dominant strategy versus uh, sort of a more equilibrium like notion. If you're assuming that people are playing the, uh, that everybody else is reporting truthfully, isn't that um, the room tech notion, or maybe, maybe there's a for all quantifier, so it's okay? Yeah, it turns out that I guess, yeah, uh, it'll be okay. Uh, yeah. So do you know if the relation principles still holds in this study? That's that we restrict your attention to Truth direct instead of looking for general equilibrium and mechanism and trying to optimize away. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good You mean restrict your attention to a mechanism where you just each player reports their type? instead of like reporting some function of their type or something? Or? Well, it, yeah, that, is, that would be a non-direct mechanism. Which yeah. We have any sub strategies um, <coughs> rather than reporting your type directly? Yeah, so actually, uh, there, there, is some, there are some interesting questions about whether direct revelation um, is, the, is the right thing. Uh, and maybe I'll touch on that a little, a little bit later. Yeah. Okay, so, um, all right, so. What I want to say on this slide is basically, uh, so, so, okay, so we're, we're building a mechanism that satisfies differential privacy, and because we're considering these restricted loss functions, this gives us a bound on how much the privacy loss can be. And then this gives us some hope, right? This, we're not done yet, but this gives us some hope that we can then counterbalance this loss in privacy with uh, utility, either through payments or through, through something else, through the utility of the, the outcome. Okay, but uh, the, the point of the slide I want to mention is that um, really, in this setting, differential privacy is not the goal. It's just a tool. Right? It's a tool to allow us to give some kind of meaningful bound on the privacy loss. And then once we have some, you know, once we, once we know that this privacy loss is, uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not infinite, it's not like, uh, that it's smaller than something, then we can hope to, um, hope to compensate for it with uh, some other utility. Okay, so, so let me, so that was a kind of a discussion at a very high level. Let me now bring this to a more concrete setting where we're going to talk about a specific kind of game. So this game is uh, purchasing private data. So suppose that, uh, you know, we have some data analyst who wants to publish some study. The study might be a little bit embarrassing. And so uh, he needs to incentivize the um, individuals to uh, participate somehow. And so in the setting that we're going to consider, the individuals, they don't, they're not going to assign any utility to the outcome of the analysis at all. They don't really care about you know, the scientists publishing this paper. But they are privacy sensitive. So they're not going to just give their uh, private data to the, to the analyst uh, without some kind of compensation, because that would give them net uh, utility loss. Okay. And so since these individuals don't care about the outcome, the only way that the, the analyst can uh, compensate for the, the privacy loss is to use some kind of a payment. Okay, and I, I want to emphasize that this is, you know, this is, a, this is a real problem, right? This is not just a, a made-up problem. And 
Oh, this, this is a made-up problem, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is a real problem because without compensation, it's not individually rational for the, the, the players to participate. And so you're actually going to get uh, potentially a very biased sample because it's going to be people who care the least about their data who are going to, to volunteer, and that might, you know, that might select for people with certain kind of delayed, uh, data. Okay, so what can we hope to do to try to um, fix the situation? So we're going to try to apply uh, the ideas that we just discussed and you know, try to come up with a, uh, a mechanism that takes privacy into account. So we're going to, in addition to uh, soliciting the, eliciting the private data from the individuals, we're also going to elicit their privacy valuations. We're going to run the mechanism now with differential privacy so that we can guarantee some kind of uh, bound on their privacy loss. And then we're going to make some payments to them in order to compensate for that privacy loss. So I'm going to make a few additional assumptions. So I'm going to assume uh, that the data is always correct, so that the individuals cannot lie about their data. OK, this is, this is a strong assumption, I admit, but it, it can be appropriate in various settings. You know, for example, if it's like a medical study, then this is like the outcome of a test. It's, it's hard to fool a test, right? You, you, it's not easy to lie about the test results. So we can assume that, um, that the data is, itself is correct. However, the, what the individuals can lie about are their valuations, right? They might pretend that they value privacy a lot more than they actually do in order to try to get more money out of the system. Okay, and so the challenge is how do we compute the payments so that we avoid both overpaying because it's very expensive and we also avoid underpaying because then, you know, we might be back in the, 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 set, the, the problem before where we're going to get a very biased sample. And we're going to try to do, you know, try to fix, you know, try to compute these payments in a way such that we're going to get the actual uh, true valuations from the players. And that'll help us in, you know, finding what the correct payments are. So the main challenge in this, uh, this setting is the, the fact that the privacy valuations and the private data can be highly correlated. All right, so think about, you know, the, the very embarrassing bit, whether or not you drink prune juice then it seems reasonable to assume that uh, you know, your privacy valuation will be very high if that bit is one, but uh, it'll, it won't be very high if that bit is zero. And so the problem here is that now an analyst who makes his decisions only seeing the valuation and not even looking at the data bit at all might still be harming your privacy because making that decision based on the valuation plus the fact that the valuation is correlated with the data, together it's going to reveal something about your data. Right? So imagine the following. So suppose that you know, the, the way the analyst works is he's going to look at the valuation, and if it's really high, then he's just not going to include someone in the data, uh, in the study, and if it's you know, reasonably low, then he'll include them and pay them something. Okay. So if Alice has a very high valuation, and you know, it's reasonable to assume that in this case her data bit is one, even if you know, we don't look at it, the analyst might decide not to include them. And in the other case, the analyst might uh, decide to include her if, uh, if her valuation is low. Then an observer, you know, maybe the observer can learn something about uh, whether or not Alice was included. Right? So this, this doesn't reveal the actual, her actual data bit, but the fact that she participated or not is somehow leaked you know, with, uh, with some advantage. Then if I believe, that if the observer believes that Alice was not included, he can then infer that Alice has a uh, data bit equal to one. And so even if uh, we made her decision entirely just based on the privacy evaluation, uh, we've leaked some information about her data bit. Okay, and so what do we need to do? Well, if we leak some information about the data bit, we need to compensate her. Right? So even though I decided not to include her in the study at all, I still need to compensate her for the privacy loss. And not only do I need to compensate her, the amount that I have to compensate her it has to grow unbounded with Alice's, pri Alice's privacy valuation if we want to maintain individual rationality. Right? Because it could be that Alice uh, values privacy so, so much that um, you know, no matter what payment I want to make, I have to make something more in order to uh, compensate her. Okay. Yep. Uh, clarify one question here. So the yep. reason the analyst Avoid, avoid paying, yeah. Uh, 
someone who has high valuation. For yeah. Price. Yeah, that's the intuitively the reason. Yeah. So does this would this also bias the study possibly? Uh, uh, as far yeah. As you? Yeah, and that's still uh, a challenge that we don't quite know how to resolve. But I'll show I'll show you some positive results, like showing how we get part of the way there, but we're really not all the way there yet. Yeah. Um, how much time do I have left? Oh, um, so the way we we the we have the room till one thirty, but we try to wrap up uh, you know, earlier, okay. not too long after. Okay. Uh, not one. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll try to be fast. I might have to skip some stuff, but okay. So um, this this challenge here, the the challenge of the you know dealing with correlations between the valuation and the the data, it actually can be formalized, and we can use it to prove uh, impossibility results. So what we proved on um, joint work with uh, Kobe and Salil and building on an earlier result uh, of Ghosh and Roth is that for quote unquote reasonable privacy loss functions, I'm not gonna define what reasonable means because it's technical, but you know, think of these privacy loss functions that are bounded by differential privacy. Right? Those, are, those are reasonable and they're captured in this, in this proof. We, we capture a broader class, uh, but they're, you know, in particular we capture those. Uh, for reasonable privacy loss functions uh, where you know, the privacy valuation is sensitive, right? Where like the fact that, uh, where we don't want to leak any information about uh, the privacy valuations of the, play, uh, of the players, notably because it might be correlated with their actual data itself. There does not exist any truthful and individually rational mechanism that makes finite payments and that accurately computes even a very simple task, like a sum of data bits. Okay. So let me give you a very brief sketch the way that we prove this is by constructing a sequence of hybrid inputs, so inputs that interpolate between two extremes. So the extremes are the database where all the players' bits are equal to zero versus the database where all the players' bits are equal to one. Clearly, the mechanism should be uh, produce very different answers on these two databases, right, if we're trying to compute a sum. But what we'll show is that uh, we can construct a sequence of hybrids in such a way that uh, they must all be indistinguishable from each other, and in particular, these two endpoints must be indistinguishable, and so therefore can't be, can't be accurate. So what do these hybrids look like? So, uh, okay, so each of these columns is a database, so these are the different hybrid databases. I'll use blue to denote uh, a low valuation or a zero valuation, so this is, blue is, means that the player doesn't care about privacy at all, and red means uh, that the player has a very high valuation for privacy, so they need to be compensated a lot. Okay. So uh, the hybrids look like this. So first, we uh, so you know first we consider player one. We flip players one's valuation from low to high. Then we flip their data bit from zero to one. Then we flip the valuation back from high to low, and then we move on, move on to the second player. So second player from low to high, zero to one, and so on. And we're going to show that the output of the mechanism has to be indistinguishable for each of these hybrids. It have to be, has to produce essentially the same kind of output. So it suffices to just consider you know, what happens in the case of the first player because the same argument works for all the other players. So let's look at what happens with the first player. Let's let P max denote the maximum payment that we will ever play a, a player with zero privacy valuation. And this is using the assumption we made that the mechanism makes finite payments. So if players don't care about privacy at all, then we should pay them some, at most some finite number. Okay, so then just by the definition of Pmax, in this case, we're gonna play player one Pmax. And in this case, we're gonna play player one at most Pmax. Right? It's just by definition. Then we use the fact that the mechanism is truthful to argue that also, in these two cases, the player, player one can be paid at most uh, Pmax, right? Because otherwise, the player could cheat. He could say, even if his valuation was zero, he could pretend that it was much, much higher and then get paid more, and that would break truthfulness. Okay, so in all of these cases, uh, the player can be paid at most Pmax. 
But then I want to argue that this implies by individual rationality that all of these uh, outputs have to be look ex almost the same you know, statistically. Okay, so this is you know, just by definition. Why, why does uh, the output on this input uh, have to look the same to this and also look the same to that? Well, it's because here the player has a very, very high valuation for privacy. But we've bounded how much we can pay them. So I didn't tell you exactly what high meant, but think of high as being much, much larger than Pmax. Then in order for the mechanism to be individually rational, it must be the case that these two inputs, uh, these two outputs and these two outputs are essentially the same statistically. Because otherwise, if there were a big difference, that would cause some privacy loss, uh, some privacy loss. And that combined with the fact that this player has very high valuation for privacy means that um, their privacy loss cannot be compensated for with just this payment, and that breaks individual rationality. Okay, and the same argument holds for this input, why this input has to be, this input has to produce the same output, statistically speaking, as its two neighbors. Okay, and that's it. So that, then you repeat the argument for all the other players, and uh, you conclude that uh, at the end, this output has to be you know, essentially the same as when you run it on the all ones database. Okay, so that's an impossibility result. So, you know, I think as computer scientists, we're, we're kind of used to looking at impossibility results and only seeing opportunity. So what's the opportunity here? Um, so the opportunity is to, of course, just to, to, to relax the model and find reasonable ways of relaxing the model. Um, so let me tell you about a few attempts to relax the model. So um, one attempt is to just to relax the requirement that the mechanism be individually rational. Okay, and this, is, uh, this was uh, proposed by Liggett and Roth, where they looked at um, this, uh, this game in two steps. So they, they kind of made it a non-direct revelation kind of game, where in the first step, we uh, decide whether or not to include each person in the study. And then in the second step, we actually take their data and compute the, you know, the, the analysis that we want to compute. And they say, well, we're going to give up on individual rationality in the first step. So the choice of whether or not um, you're included in the study, this is going to leak some information. This might harm your overall utility. And that's too bad. That's just the way it is. But for all the players who are chosen to actually participate in the study and for whom it's, you know, uh, they have non-negative utility to participate in the study, we guarantee truthfulness and accuracy and, and so on. Sorry, yeah. Maybe still maintain privacy in the second step? Or? Yeah, yeah. You still run the second step with differential privacy. And, yeah. I mean, you run the first step with differential privacy as well, but it's just that um, it's not enough privacy to compensate for their, um, their loss utility. Okay, so that's, that's one approach. Um, and another approach is to limit the kinds of correlations that we uh, permit between the privacy valuation and the data. Right, so this was the main challenge I mentioned earlier. So let's see what happens if we exclude some kinds of correlation. So um, you know, in the same paper introducing this model uh, by Goshen Roth, they consider the case of completely uncorrelated valuation data. So in this case, we assume that the privacy valuation is not sensitive at all. And we only care about protecting the privacy of the data bit. And in that case, they're able to come up with you know, good mechanisms that are truthful and approximately accurate and uh, individually rational. Another approach is to uh, assume that we know what the correlation is, that there's some kind of Bayesian model that tells us how the, correla how the correlation between the privacy valuation and the data looks. And uh, in that model, Roth and Schoenbeck and Fleischer and Liu proposed, uh, also proposed models that, uh, mechanisms that satisfy um, you know, the properties we want. Uh, in our work, we propose a different kind of uh, limit to the amount of correlation that happens between the valuation and the data. And this is a more worst case, uh, it's a more worst case kind of uh, guarantee uh, as opposed to the, the Bayesian uh, guarantees that uh, were studied earlier. And so let me just briefly describe what the, this, this uh, correlation is. So the observation that we uh, made was that the correlations, typically they only go in one direction. Right? They're, not, they're not kind of like arbitrary correlations. 
So again, in the case of uh, drinking prune juice, um, you can reasonably assume that your privacy valuation when your data bit is equal to zero is going to be at most the, your privacy valuation when your data bit is equal to one. Right? It's not going to be larger because somehow this is the less embarrassing fact. Okay, and so we'll, 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 let's restrict our attention to these kinds of uh, cases. So what we do is we define a notion of monotonic neighbors where uh, we only allow neighbors of this form. So, uh, you know, again, everything is, all the inputs are the same except for, oh, okay, I don't know what happened there. Um, again, we assume that all the inputs are the same except for the ith players. And in the ith player, we assume that uh, we have a low valuation with uh, a zero bit and a one valuation with a high, uh, high sorry, a one, a zero bit with low valuation and a one bit with a high valuation. Okay, and we exclude these other possibilities. So we, so we exclude the reverse. And we also exclude um, you know, different valuations for the same data bit. Somehow this is kind of the, you know, this should, this should be the only thing that we care about uh, in practice. And what we do is we're going to, instead of considering loss functions bounded by differential privacy as before, we're going to assume that the loss functions are bounded by differential privacy, but where we restrict to these monotonic neighbors. Okay, and potentially this could be a much smaller quantity. Sorry, there should be a scaling factor here still. Potentially this can be a, a much smaller quantity because we're taking a max over a smaller set now. And so hopefully we can do something uh, with this kind of evaluation. See Adam's uh, squinting. Uh, so this is, sorry, I'm not going to ask you a question. So this is sort of a, like a strict monotonicity, right? So you're saying the, the fact that on the right that pair, the zero, zero blue pink pair, is, is ruled out. So, so actually, maybe. The, the, I guess the intuition that we're trying to capture is that we only care about the privacy valuation in as much as it reveals something about your data bit. So if your privacy valuation here is changing, but your data bit isn't changing, then we don't, we don't care in some sense. I mean, that's kind of like saying that if you kind of not take care of the other thing, that if I was one with low valuation for privacy, I would not want to lie and say that I'm one with high valuation for privacy. That will cause me to gain more. And so we still handle those kinds of manipulations, right? So I'll tell you about what our mechanism is on the next slide, but we allow for the manipulations to be arbitrary in the sense that I can say a higher valuation or a lower valuation. It's only when we measure privacy that we're restricting to, this, uh, to, to these kinds of neighbors. So maybe you can ask me uh, after a talk. Um, okay, so, uh, so we're able to produce, uh, we're, we're able to exhibit a, a mechanism for uh, this kind of uh, valuations, th these kinds of loss functions. And our, our mechanism is quite simple. So um, suppose that, you know, so we have the inputs, which are a vector of data and a vector of privacy valuations. Uh, suppose we were also given a budget constraint and some desired privacy parameter. We're going to say that a evaluation is high if it's uh, larger than this uh, threshold. And what we're going to do is we're going to just take the input. We're going to force the high valuation bits to zero. So whether the original data bit with high valuation was zero or one, we're just going to force them to zero. Okay. And so this produces like, you know, like a vector of like virtual data bits that we're going to actually compute on. And then we're just going to release this, uh, the, the, you know, the analysis on this, the set of virtual bits uh, with differential privacy. And we'll, play, uh, we'll pay the players that we used uh, with uh, this amount of payment. Okay, so what can we say about this mechanism? So what we're able to say is the following. So if we let H denote the number of players that have high valuation, then what we can show is that the mechanism uh, on the previous slide is individually rational. It's accurate up to this uh, bound. So with high probability, the deviation between the output of the mechanism, which here I wrote as x, and the correct value 
is going to be something like uh, the number of players with high valuation plus uh, 1 over epsilon. And it's going to be truthful for all the players that do not have high valuations. Okay, so admittedly, this is not as strong as we were aiming for. Right? We wanted some kind of guarantee where uh, you know, this accuracy and this truthfulness does not depend on the number of players that have um, high valuation. But we do gain individual rationality. Right? And this is not... It was not obvious before this, uh, this mechanism how you get individual rationality when you have um, these uh, correlations and uh, when you are looking at the worst case. Okay, but you know, the, the, this, this leaves open the question, which is very interesting. Uh, can you come up with a family of loss functions, reasonable loss functions, where we can achieve all of these properties but without you know, having any kind of dependence on a number of players with high valuations? That's, that's really what we'd like to do. And so far, we've been unable to do so. Uh, what we were able to show is that this, you know, this goal is not achievable um, by simply looking at uh, loss functions bounded by differential privacy for monotonic valuations. So this relaxation that we define is not enough to achieve this goal. Okay, so you need to look at some other relaxation. OK, so I don't have much time. Let me just fly through this last part, I guess. Uh, so, so in the previous part, we were talking about how to use payments to compensate players for their privacy loss. But you can also imagine there are settings where um, you know, the outcome of the mechanism itself uh, is going to produce some utility for the player. So think of like auctions or a facility location. Uh, let me not dwell on this too much. Um, so, okay, maybe I should just say why. So we simplify our life a little bit because uh, recall before we were assuming that the players can lie about their valuations, but they couldn't lie about their data bit. So now if you think of like a setting like auctions or like facility location, what they can lie about is their actual preference, right? They can lie about where they, where they live or they can lie about what they, how much they're willing to pay for an item or so on. Um, and so, necessarily we're going to have to allow them to lie about that. Or otherwise, we're, we're sort of assuming away the problem. But to make our life a little bit simpler, we're going to assume that they don't lie about their privacy evaluation. And I, I admit, again, this is a, you know, an oversimplification, but um, we have a hard enough time dealing with this, so let's, let's make that simplification for now. So we'll assume that, uh, in this case, uh, the privacy evaluations are kind of publicly known and they're not private, they're not sensitive and that they're used, in particular, they're used only as a scaling factor. So there's some loss function that doesn't depend on the privacy valuations, it only depends on the, you know, the data and the, out the outcome, and then we just scale it by the, the privacy valuation. Okay, so, um, so naively, we might hope that just by using differential privacy, we can achieve uh, we can achieve all of our, all the properties that we want, truthfulness, accuracy, and individual rationality um, for, for this, kind of a, uh, this kind of a setting. And you know, the naive hope is that you know, because differential privacy bounds our privacy loss, maybe we can make it so much smaller than the, uh, the utility, the change in utility that we, uh, we get overall that the mechanism is truthful uh, and accurate. However, the naive attempt fails. So at least for some uh, loss functions and some games, you can come up with you know, natural games, things like facility location, where the amount of utility that you, that, uh, the amount of influence that any particular player has on the uh, utility they gain at the end, it kind of vanishes as the number of players goes to infinity. Because kind of, you know, if we're trying to place the facility, if there are like 1,000 players, then my single preference is not going to move that facility by very much. So that combined with the fact that we can prove some you know, lower bounds on privacy shows us that uh, the privacy loss is going to be large, even though my influence on the outcome is small. And so maybe it makes sense for me to actually just lie about my data because I'm not going to change my utility much by telling the truth. But at least it'll, it'll save me something in privacy because now my true data is not going into the, into the, data, into the calculation at all. Okay. 
Um, but fortunately, uh, Kobe and Salil and Yiling and Stephen were here to, to come up with um, some positive results. So we do know how to, uh, for certain games, we're able to um, overcome this kind of negative result. Re remember, that, wasn't, that was definitely not as strong of a negative result as I, the one I showed earlier, where we kind of ruled out all possibilities. The, the one I just uh, described is you know, for a very specific setting. And what um, these works were able to show is that for you know, some other settings, uh, reasonable settings, we are able to uh, achieve the properties that we want. So um, Kobe et al, they showed that uh, we can achieve approximately optimal mechanisms uh, with truthfulness, even under this privacy aware setting. Uh, if we were allowed to constrain how players react to the outcome of the game. So if, for example, in the case of facility location, um, after I place, you know, after I decide where to place a facility, I tell you, you can only go to this facility, you can't go somewhere else. Um, and their work also uh, makes the assumption that um, there aren't too many players with uh, high privacy valuations. Actually, that's kind of what inspired one, one of the inspirations for what we did uh, with uh, the purchasing private data mechanism. And then uh, Chen et al. showed that uh, you can also achieve approximately truthful, uh, approximately optimal and truthful mechanisms for social choice problems by implementing uh, the VCG mechanism with these privacy-aware utilities, uh, utility functions. And what they, the, the key idea that they used to, uh, to do this was to show that if we have a bound, uh, if we know that a mechanism is epsilon differentially private, then actually on average, the privacy loss is much better. It's actually epsilon squared. And so they're able to show that here, the privacy loss won't be too large and that the, um, you know, the benefit that you get from telling the truth in terms of your um, sort of traditional utility is going to be significantly larger than the privacy loss you get from having private data uh, leaked. And so overall, it's still better for you to tell the truth. Okay, so uh, let me just wrap up. So I, I think this is a really you know, exciting area and the question of finding the right model is still very much open. Um, you know, one interesting question is to combine this you know, payment-based model I talked about first with this outcome-based model and allow players to you know, lie about everything and see what can you do there. Um, and you know, we saw that even in these kind of uh, initial models that we've studied so far, uh, there are a lot of impossibility results, uh, in particular in the purchasing private data model. So maybe there are, you know, we need to look at other ways of quantifying privacy that are uh, weaker than uh, differential privacy. So we looked at um, this uh, differential privacy with uh, monotonic valuations, but maybe there are some other relaxations that we should be looking for. And then finally, I think for, you know, for, for the, the field in general, uh, it, really, it would really be nice to understand how individuals actually value privacy in practice. Like are there, you know, I, and I'm definitely the wrong person to, to be suggesting things to do for this, but you know, are there experiments or, or things that we can do to see how players react to uh, privacy loss and then to use that information to give a more accurate model in a, in a mathematical framework? That's it, thanks. No. That thing? No. So, for example, in the work of um, Yuling and Salil and Stephen, they they say you know they, they propose you can you can um, uh, you look at the ratio and you look at some uh, I guess concave function of the of the ratio. Uh, so, a function that tends to zero as the tends ratio to, tends to one. Yeah. Probably the same should work in in, in our paper as well. Probably yeah. Yeah. So I don't think the log is essential, but. It seemed, you know, since we were importing these ideas from differential privacy, that that was the most convenient choice to make. But, um, and kind of the, the, the impossibility results and everything that we have, they would make sense without that, right? I mean, I didn't describe what a reasonable loss function was in our, in our result, but definitely would capture any kind of reasonable function of the, 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 the ratio, not just, not just the log. In the, um, in the 
mentioned about the relationship between the value and the private information. Um, I just want to make sure I understand. So, so the accuracy claim, you, you didn't talk about the bias and, and, and if, if the, and, and you didn't talk about correlation again, but at least if you did, I missed it. But am I right that, that if, if, if all of the ones happen to be with the high value people, then, well, then, then you get low accuracy, but you also yeah. get bias as well? Yeah, yeah, you get a bias. So the, the, the guarantee that we get here, this, uh, this H should actually, it's only, it's going to be biased in one direction. It's not going to be um, spread evenly. And do you have a result that says somehow that you need to get some, that you need to introduce a bias into the estimator? Um, no. So, I mean, so for, for these, you know, for this class of loss functions, we have results saying that, um, I'm not sure about the bias, but definitely you can't get, you know, arbitrarily good accuracy. Um, but for, you know, another class of loss functions, um, we don't have like a blanket result says, that says you need bias. Intuitively, one would expect something like, if you have a finite budget, which is the, the case that's considered in the theorem, there's yeah. people who value privacy much more yeah. than, than your budget can afford to compensate for privacy losses. It's, I, I don't know what to what extent it, it's going to formalize it, yeah. but it seems very hard to take into account those people's data if you don't have enough to, money to pay them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a good way to put it. So, I mean, so when, I, when I'm asking this question about trying to get uh, worst case accuracy, individual rationality and truthfulness for all inputs, I meant in the case of uh, unbounded budget. So if I can spend as much as I want as a function of how much you know, people tell me they care about their privacy, can I achieve something? And that we don't know. But uh, yeah, if, if your budget is a priori fixed, then I'm pretty sure you can say something. Thank you again.